Good morning. I want to thank the program committee and session chairs for giving me the opportunity to discuss these three exciting abstracts. I will be talking about optimizing use of HER2 therapies in metastatic breast cancer. These are my disclosures. While discussing these three abstracts in setting of metastatic breast cancer, we will review if HER2-targeted ADCs are active beyond the conventional HER2-positive population, whether efficacy of trastuzumab can be improved upon by modifying the FC domain, and finally, the financial implications and access barriers to highly effective and life-prolonging HER2-targeted treatment. Trastuzumab deruxtecan or TDXD is an antibody drug conjugate with a potent TOPO1 payload, a high drug to antibody ratio, and a membrane permeable payload that allows bystander cytotoxic effect on the neighboring tumor cells. In the Destiny Breast 01 Phase 2 study, TDXD led to an impressive PFS of 20 months and an objective response rate of 61%, leading to FDA approval of this agent in 2019 for patients who had received two prior anti HER2 regimens. All of us have seen these practice saving results from Destiny 03, which demonstrated 72% improvement in PFS with TDXD compared to TDM1 in metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer. As ADCs like TDXD can elicit bystander effect, do we really need the cancer to be HER2 positive with 3 plus, IHC, 3 plus IHC or FISH positivity for these drugs to work? HER2 expression is continuous, ranging from no expression to 3 plus staining. Perhaps any expression of HER2 is adequate for these newer generation of HER2 targeted ADCs to be effective. Accordingly, there has been recent development of a new nomenclature of HER2 low breast cancer. So what exactly do we mean by HER2 low breast cancers? Tumors with HER2 IHC1 plus or 2 plus with FISH and ISH negative are classified as HER2 low and using this definition, 45 to 50% of all breast cancers are HER2 low. HER2 low prevalence differs by homoreceptor status with higher prevalence noted in homoreceptor positive breast cancer compared to TNBC. With that background in mind, let's look at the DAISY study, which assessed TDXD for advanced breast cancer patients regardless of HER2 status. This trial enrolled 186 patients who had received one or more chemotherapy in metastatic setting. All patients underwent biopsy of metastatic site at study entry and central HER2 testing of the metastatic sample determined the three cohorts. Cohort one was comprised of patients with HER2 overexpressed breast cancer, cohort two was HER2 low breast cancer, and cohort three was HER2 non-detected defined by HER2 IHC of zero plus. The primary endpoint was best objective response rate in each cohort. This table here summarizes the statistical plan of the study. In cohort one among 67 evaluable patients, 27 or more responses were deemed the cohort successful. Cohort two and three were anticipated to enroll 40 patients each and 13 or more responses were needed in these cohorts to declare success. 38% of patients fell in HER2 overexpressed cohort one, 41% in HER2 low cohort and 21% in HER2 non-detected cohort. 80% of the patients in the HER2 low cohort had hormone receptor positive disease, and two thirds in the HER2 non detected cohort had hormone receptor positive disease. 80% of the patients had received greater than two lines of metastatic treatment. In terms of safety, ILD was reported in 2.8% of patients, with all cases being grade one and two, and all five patients with ILD discontinued treatment. These are the results. The objective response rate in cohort one was 70%, was 37% in cohort two, and 30% in cohort three. Role and efficacy of TDXD in HER2 positive breast cancer is well established, so I will focus more on efficacy details of cohort two and three. In cohort two, the response rate appeared similar in homoreceptor positive disease and TMBC. The overall PFS was 6.7 months in this cohort, and even though the response rate was similar in hormoreceptor positive and TNBC, PFS was lower in TNBC compared to hormoreceptor positive disease. In the HER2 non-detected cohort three, response rate was almost 30%, but based upon the, the stipulated uh, trial design, this cohort did not uh, meet the criteria for success. When assessed by hormoreceptor status, the objective response rate appeared similar in TNBC and hormoreceptor positive disease. However, uh, PFS was lower for cohort three compared to cohort two. And as we was noted in cohort two, the PFS was lower for hormoreceptor positive disease compared to TNBC with a PFS of only 2.1 months uh, in the TNBC patients. I do wanna point out that given small numbers, this analysis based on hormoreceptor status should be interpreted with caution. However, these findings do raise the question regarding the role of hormone receptor status on efficacy of HER2 ADCs in setting of low or absent HER2 expression. 
Other studies have demonstrated preliminary efficacy of HER2-targeted ADCs in HER2 low breast cancer. In a previous study among 54 patients, TDXD led to a response rate of 37% and a PFS of 11 months, with a higher efficacy seen in hormoreceptor positive HER2 low disease compared to hormoreceptor negative HER2 low disease. In the expansion cohort of trastuzumab duocarmazine, objective response rate was 28% and 40% respectively for hormoreceptor positive HER2 low and hormoreceptor and hormoreceptor negative HER2 low disease. Another ADC, RC48, has also shown an objective response rate of 40% in HER2 low expressing breast cancer. So in summary, the activity of TDXD noted in DAISY for patients with HER2 overexpressed breast cancer is consistent with the established efficacy of this agent in previously treated population. ILD rates were a little lower compared to previous study, and more importantly, no grade three to five events were noted, suggesting that as we gain more experience with using this agent, providers are getting better at early identification and treatment of ILD. In the HER2 low group, very encouraging efficacy was seen and is consistent with what has been observed in recent studies of TDXD and other ADCs for this subgroup. Phase three trials testing HER2 targeted ADC in HER2 low breast cancer are ongoing, and if positive, will add an important treatment option for this large subset of patients. Hormone receptor status may have an important role in biological heterogeneity of HER2 low disease and potentially impact the efficacy of HER2 targeted ADC. In a very nice study that included over 3,500 patients with HER2 low breast cancer, Alicia Platt's group has recently shown that within HER2 low breast cancer, ERB B2 transcript level, levels are higher in hormone receptor positive disease compared to TNBC. In hormone receptor positive disease, ERB B2 transcript levels are higher in HER2 low compared to HER2 zero, but in TNBC, there are no differences in ERB B2 levels across the IHC groups. In the HER2 non-detected group, there was intriguing efficacy, which at least based on PFS seemed to be confined primarily to the hormone receptor positive subset. The key question here is, are we seeing activity when HER2 is totally absent, or was it simply failure to detect low levels of HER2 expression? A challenge with HER2 IHC testing, especially at lower levels, is the testing technique and reproducibility. HER2 zero is defined as weak or incomplete staining in less than 10% of tumor cells, which does not necessarily mean complete lack of expression, as these cutoffs were not geared to detect and report low levels of expression. One study that looked at concordance between local and central testing reported only a 15% concordance for HER2 IHC0+. Thus, more quantitative and reproducible assays are needed for efficient use of HER2 as a therapeutic target. This trial summarizes ongoing phase three trials of HER2 ADCs in HER2 low breast cancer. All the trials are using central HER2 testing. Destiny 04 has already completed approval, and Destiny 06 actually also includes a cohort of patients with HER2 IC of greater than zero, but less than one. Now moving on to margituximab and the SOFIA results. Margituximab is an FC-engineered HER2 monoclonal antibody with increased affinity for deactivating FC gamma receptor CD16A and decreased affinity for the inhibitory FC gamma receptor CD32B. Increased CD16A engagement is thought to induce more potent ADC as compared to trastuzumab. Some, although not all previous studies, have suggested a possible greater benefit of trastuzumab in patients with high affinity VV genotype compared to the low affinity FV or FF genotypes. And previous studies have shown that compared to trastuzumab, margituximab displays increased binding to all CD16 AVF variants. Notably, majority, almost 85% of, of people are CD16 A low affinity F allele carriers. Sophia compared physician's choice chemotherapy given with either trastuzumab or margituximab in patients who had received two or more prior therapies. Today, Dr. Rupa presented the overall survival results. The PFS results of SOFIA have already been published. There was a 24% reduction in risk of disease progression or death with margituximab compared to trastuzumab with the median PFS of 4.9 months in the trastuzumab arm and 5.8 months in the margituximab arm. In December 2020, FDA approved margituximab in combination with chemotherapy for patients with previously treated metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer. Final overall survival analysis shows no improvement in OS with margituximab compared to trastuzumab with the median OS of over 21 months in both the arms. 
OS when assessed by CD16A genotype, which was a pre-specified but non-alpha allocated analysis, shows a suggestion of OS benefit for magituximab over trastuzumab in the F carriers, especially if they were FF homozygotes. On the flip side, in the VV homozygotes, trastuzumab appeared to be better than magituximab. These results are quite intriguing, but should be interpreted with caution given small subgroups. And we also do not know if other variables like disease characteristics were balanced between the two treatment arms for this FF and VV genotype subgroup analysis. So in summary, margituximab plus chemotherapy leads to modest PFS improvement with no OS advantage over trastuzumab plus chemotherapy. Analysis of CD16A genotypes suggests potential benefit of margituximab in F homozygous patients, although the biological rationale behind these observations is not entirely clear. An ongoing new adrenaline margo study is comparing trastuzumab to margituximab in the F carriers, and perhaps placing this agent in genotype-selected patients and also earlier in the disease course where a higher immune impact could be elicited may be a beneficial strategy for future. We now have many agents and strategies available for sequential treatment of HER2-positive metastatic breast cancer. NCCN guidelines states that most patients will be candidates for multiple lines of systemic therapy and recommend continuing HER2-targeted therapy following progression and first-line therapy. With that background, let us review the last abstract, which comes from Canada, a public payer healthcare system. The current funding policy in British Columbia restricts two lines of HER2-directed therapy for metastatic breast cancer. This analysis presented here today includes 230 patients that received HER2-directed treatment for metastatic disease between 2018 and 2013. Of these, 25% of patients had stable disease on first and second line treatment, thus not needing third line treatment. Another 25% had declining performance status, prohibiting further therapy. This left 112 patients that were eligible for third-line HER2 therapy, and out of those, 77% or 86 received HER2-directed therapy as third-line treatment, and 23% received other types of treatment. Baseline disease characteristics and details on type of first and second-line treatment for patient continuing or not continuing HER2 therapy are not provided. And based on personal communication with first author, Dr. Jackson, the treatment details for third-line therapy are as, as below, trastuzumab plus chemo for 30%, TDM1 for 30%, and lapatinib for 22%. Most patients receive this treatment either through clinical trial or expanded access uh, program through pharma. The overall survival is reported from the time of diagnosis of metastatic disease and not from the start of HER2-directed therapy. Median overall survival was 58 months in the patients who continued third-line HER2 therapy and 37 months in those who received other types of treatment. We do not know how much of this OS difference is contributed by the third-line treatment versus the first and the second-line HER2 treatment. It is also not known if the first-line pertuzumab or second-line TDM use were balanced between the two arms. The median OS in patients who continued third-line HER2 treatment um, is consistent with what was seen in the pertuzumab arm of the Cleopatra study and the real-world data from France. Since 2018, additional third-line agents are now approved by Health Canada, although access continues to be an issue due to lag in provincial funding. The authors reported that if these survival trends continued and patients regularly received third-line trastuzumab therapy, there would be an anticipated additional cost of $68,000 per patient. In the contemporary era, third-line treatment will include newer, more expensive agents, further driving costs up. Other measures like quality-adjusted life years, incremental cost-effective ratio, and quality of life are not reported today, but the study team is planning to look at these measures. With advances in cancer treatment, overall cancer care costs have increased and are anticipated to continue to rise in the coming years. The rising cost impact access. Trastuzumab is included in the WHO essential medication list and in a recent international study, oncologists listed trastuzumab in the top 20 high priority medicines. Unfortunately, universal availability of the top 20 cancer medicines was reported to be as low as 9% in low income countries. And even in high income countries, this availability was as low as 68% in many situations. These findings highlight the interplay between cancer care cost, access and quality and their impact on value, equity and public health. So in conclusion, HER2 her targeted ADCs are showing promise in HER2 low breast cancer with phase three trial results awaited. 
HER2 status may be a key determinant of the underlying biology of HER2 low breast cancer and ability to use HER2 low as a therapeutic target. Margituximab provides only modest improvement over trastuzumab in pretreated HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer, and the efficacy may be dependent on genotype. The ongoing new adjuvant study may shed light, more light on that question. Cost and access to life prolonging HER2 therapy is a complex public health issue. And although we have so many HER2 targeted drugs that are changing the course of the disease, patient access to these agents is far from optimal. I would like to thank all the three presenters for providing their slides and for answering my many questions and, for doc and to Dr. Tolani and Dr. Kropp for their insightful comments. Thank you for your attention.